screen. So this is our program introduction. And uh, Mike, would you like to give your introduction? Yes, absolutely. I first of all want to uh, wish everyone good afternoon. My name is Michael Palercio. Uh, I want to thank you for joining uh, to us today for the Cincinnati Art Club monthly programs presentation. Uh, this month's program will feature one of our Cincinnati Art Club's founders and Frank Dubinek. Uh, we're honored to have Kristen Spangenberg, curator of prints at the Cincinnati Art Museum to deliver today's talk. Uh, last year, she published an essay entitled Frank Dubinek and the Etching Revival, conjunction with the museum show of Frank Dubinek, American Master. Uh, Kristen earned a uh, bachelor's degree at the University of California at Davis and then had a master's degree from the University of Michigan. She's a member of the Print Council of America, the American Historical Print Collector Society, and the Circus Historical Society. We're also pleased to have her as our final judge for this year's Founder Show, which will be held in April at the Cincinnati Art Club. Uh, ask, uh, note that uh, entries for the show are now being accepted through the front page of the CAC website. And now it's with great honor that I present Kristen Spangenberg. Okay. <laughs> Don't put, push okay. What? What? Uh oh. Don, what does he need to do? He needs to give permission to you to change. Oh, Don, you need to give permission to me to change the screen. You're on mute, Don. Kristen, I've made you. Um, yes, we got it. The host, so you should be able to share. Okay, I think we're all set up. <clears throat> um, first of all, I want to tell you that there is a very good chance that Frank Dubinek, American Master, will be extended through May 2nd. Uh, we, are, we have pending permission on the loan of three paintings, uh, which actually have to go to the board of the uh, trustees of the th three lenders. Uh, in addition, I wanted to tell you that the grand experiment in Italy, etchings by Dubinek and his students, which are all works given uh, by Dubinek uh, and date from 1880 to 1882, um, will be enhanced by six additional uh, etchings. And the only reason was that our HVAC system immediately above one side of the exhibition, and this is immediately outside the entrance to the Frank Dubinek painting exhibition. Uh, the coils broke and water was running down on the floor. And so we've just fixed the coils and by I think the first, first week in March, we will have the additional works uh, up in the cases on the left side as you enter the exhibition. What I'm going to share with you today is basically the lecture I gave to our docents who normally tour the exhibition. Uh, and uh, so let's move forward. 
Uh, Mr. Dubinick, in his recent views of Venice, has given us work which is very strong, delightful in color, and astonishingly individual. Once in a way, he has shown too visibly the working of Mr. Whistler's influence, but he is quite himself and therefore infinitely more attractive in such place as Desdemona's house, the Rialto, the portal of St. Mark's, and San Pietro in Castello. Their techniques, quality, technical qualities, and their picturesqueness is produced not by eliminating so common called commonplace modern elements of the scene, but just by giving these elements great prominence and contrasting them with others. And this is a local sort of printed review of his work. Artists in the mid 19th century took up etching as an original creative medium. They promoted its freedom of expression as akin to drawing distinct from reproductive printmaking. The etching revival and international movement heir to the spirit of Rembrandt began in England and gained momentum in France in the 1860s as a medium equivalent in prestige to painting. In the forefront of the revival was Charles Jacques, Jean-Francois Millet, Charles Daubigny, Corot, and the publisher Alfred Cadard, who energetically promoted etching. By the late 1870s, enthusiasm for original etching reached American shores. Frank Duvenek, known as a painter, made etchings and later monotypes as he was approaching the peak of his career. As far as we know, he executed approximately 30 etchings and a number of monotypes. Although he was new to the medium, his artistry enabled him to work with confidence, creating dynamic and competent works that were praised by his contemporaries and by the critics of the day. Now, there is only one compilation of Duvenek's prints, a two-part article by Emily Poole uh, done in 1938, which appeared in Print Collectors Quarterly. Uh, unfortunately, that's now 80, over 80 years old. <clears throat> In the fall of 1878, Duvenek had returned to Munich after spending nearly a year in Venice with William Merritt Chase and John Twachman. The younger American students, dissatisfied with the Royal Academy curriculum, prevailed upon Duvenek to be their instructor. Duvenek held classes first in Munich and then in a, an abandoned monastery in the village of Poling, southwest of the city. McEwen, who was one of his students, recalled Duvenek's first experiment in printmaking. I saw a good deal of him and urged him to try etching, which I was interested in. In talking it over, we with him, he said he had a few copper plates. I said, I have some wax and I'll come up and ground your plates and then you can put something on them. When I arrived, he had two plates for me to ground, but I found on one, he had scratched a dry point nude. That's what you're looking at, at on the screen. He was very surprised and disappointed when I told him it was finished and we, we'd take it to the printer. We did so, and he was pleased with the result. Unfamiliar with the process, Duvenek apparently did not realize until McEwen told him that he had actually executed a dry point plate. And here he refers it to it as etching. <clears throat> In June 1879, Elizabeth Booth, an aspiring painter, engaged Duvenek for weekly private instruction in Munich. By September, she persuaded him to move his classes to Florence, where she and her father rented an apartment in the Villa Castellani on Villa Grosso. She facilitated business arrangements and Duvenek's entree into Florence's Anglo-American expatriate society and organized a woman's painting class, encouraged encouraging her William Morris Hunt classmates in Boston to come out and get a winter in Italy and the best teacher in the world. 
a smaller group, the Charcoal Club, which included painters John White Alexander, Louis Ritter, and Gertrude Elizabeth Lloyd, met once a week in, a different, in different homes for drawing in charcoal, modeling, etching, etc., combined with music and tea. <laughs> In the following spring, uh, Dubinek returned to Venice, alternating summers there with winters in Florence. <clears throat> Since the time of uh, the don't worry about century it. artist okay. Can Canaletto, Venice has said, that's right. as don't a source it. of inspiration for an international array well, of no, artists no seeking to capture the magnificent don't worry about me. watery vistas. The grand Grandeur yeah, of historic I'll architecture, the city's wealth of exotic inhabitants, Dubedek's early Venetian etchings yeah, coincide imagine. with the presence of, uh, of American expatriate uh, <laughs> James McNeil Whistler. Seeking. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, thank you, though. I appreciate it. Are, are, I'm hearing another voice. Did somebody not have their mic open? Everybody's supposed to be muted. The person with the iPhone is the one that's making the noise. Yeah. To, uh, <clears throat> okay, bye then. Uh, Venetian's Benici, ex uh, coincide with the presence of American expatriate James McNeil Whistler, seeking to recoup his reputation and fortune. Whistler had sued John Ruskin for libeling him in a review and a confluence of unpaid, unpaid commissions with construction expenditures for his White House bankrupted him. He accepted a commission for the, from the Fine Arts Society, which was a gallery in London, to produce 12 etchings of Venice, an internationally recognized a printmaker. Whistler had published his French set in 1858 and his Thames set in 1871. He arrived in Venice in mid-September 1879. Dubinick and his boys descended late the following spring and Otto Henry Bacher, one of Dubinick's boys and, a, and an experienced etcher originating from Cleveland, brought with him his homemade press and supplies. He provided technical assistance to Dubinick and shared his press with Whistler and the boys. Now Whistler sought a less fashionable Venice in, in Venice, favoring distant horizons, anonymous passages and narrow canals. Dubinick's etchings executed between 1880 and 1885 focus on popular landmarks and the activities of everyday Venetians set against centuries-old architecture. Approximately 10 etchings exist from the time before Dubinek understood the bite or action of acid on copper. Dubinek roomed on at Casa Kirsch on the Riva della Scaglione between Santa Maria della Prite and Rio del Prita. In June 1880, upon meeting Bacher and the boys, Whistler moved to the Casa Jakovic on the Riva della Baggio, to have access to Bacher's press. Both Quay's locations face westward toward the Dodgers Palace and across the San Marco Lagoon toward Santa Maria, excuse me, San Giorgio Maggiore and Santa Maria Santa de Luce. And you see here uh, a view across uh, the San Marco, uh, the, the lagoon. <clears throat> Um, so we are looking at, on the left, uh, Duvenek's Salute Large Plate, which dominates the horizon compared with Whistler's first state of the upright uh, Salute, uh, which, dom uh, which uh, has delicate lines suggesting shipping and architecture. Accord according to Bacher, six months later, Whistler reworked his upright salute day, which is what you're looking at on the right, adding a busy quay in the foreground, thus differentiating it from Duvenex, which is seen on the left. 
<clears throat> Both artists etched the Soto Porto Sec Segunda de la Colone, a warehouse <clears throat> uh, turned residence just east of Casa Jakovovitz. The sloping waterfront was used for unloading timber and drying sails. Um, the mutual influence can be discerned in Duvedek's archway, vignette, uh, vignetted men sitting on the logs and a passage uh, beyond the arch, while Duvedek's San Bajo, which you're looking at here, excuse me, Whistler's San Bajo, focuses on the sunlit facade and beach boasts. Duvedek's was far more abbreviated. <clears throat> In the summer of 1880, Duvedek was commissioned by Edmund M. Blood down from Florence to do portraits of himself and his daughter Gertrude before they returned to Britain. Duvedek also made a print after Gertrude's high society portrait, uh, <clears throat> which you see on the left. In the first state, the hands and fan and the silhouetting the figure remain incomplete. The beguiling Miss Blood was Duvenek's answer to the society portraits of his acclaimed contemporaries such as John Singer Sargent and James Abbott McNeil Whistler. Given his reputation for boldness, the choice of Duvenek for such a consignment was adventurous. The Irish beauty Gert Gertrude Elizabeth Blood studied with Duvenek in Florence in the class for women that Elizabeth Booth had organized. Blood also belonged to the Charcoal Club, a little group in which Elizabeth, Frank, and others gathered for merit and creative pursuits. Gertrude was also briefly Elizabeth's rival for Frank's affections. And I just want to point out that the portrait of Miss Blood, uh, the painting, is a very recent acquisition from the museum. <clears throat> Now, John White Alexander's early talent as a draftsman attracted attention. At 18, he moved to New York City, where he worked at Harper's Weekly for three years as an illustrator and cartoonist. For his formal training as a painter, he traveled to Munich, where he fell under the spell of Frank Duvenick. He followed him to Italy in 1878, along with another Duvenick boy, Charles Alba Corwin. In, eight, in 1938, and Lemony Poole, the museum's assistant in charge of prints, incorrectly cataloged portrait of Corwin and another etching as the work of Frank Duvenek. In the museum's donation ledger for 1913, Duvenek clearly identified the portrait as the work of John White Alexander. This is further verified by the artist's faint JWH monogram on Corwin's right shoulder. The pencil inscription along the lower edge etched in Venice July 8, 1880 was unfortunately removed in the past. No other etchings by Alexander other than the two owned by the museum and incorrectly cataloged by Emily Poole. And this is of course one of my discoveries. Um, <clears throat> are known. The Riva first version, previously undocumented, uh, not purchased by CIM in 1910, uh, was, per was purchased by CIM in 1910 from Bacher's estate sale. It is inscribed the Riva trial and uses brown ink used by Bacher. <clears throat> Whistler returned to London in November 1880, exhibiting his first Venice set, including the Riva, number one, uh, December in the December at the Fine Arts Society. According to Bacher, it is only fair to say that Dubinek made the etching of the Riva before Whistler made his. Whistler saw them as I was helping Duvenek bite the plates and frankly said Whistler must do the Reba as well. The etchings <clears throat> are um, 
or excuse me, in, in March 1881, Gertrude sent three of Dubinek's Venetian etchings to the first exhibition of the Society of Painter Etchers at the Hanover Gallery, thrusting him into the limelight. And the reason was because on March 17th, Francis Seymour Hayden, who was society president and Whistler's brother-in-law because he had married Whistler's sister, along with the French painter Alphonse Gros, uh, visited the exhibition requested to see the work of Whistler, whom they knew had recently exhibited Venetian etchings. <clears throat> Seeing Dubinek's Venetian etchings, Hayden, Legro, and Hamilton were suspicious as to whether Whistler, having, having not participated in the exhibition, had instead submitted, submitted etchings under the nom de plume of Frank Dubinek, thus violating a contract he had with the Fine Arts Society. Learning of the slur to his integrity, Whistler created a dust-up with letters uh, to the papers, which were published in the Pikers Pakers and reprinted in the Gentle Art of Making Enemies in 1890. Now Hayden wrote to Duvenek on March 17th. Duvenek, unfortunately, that letter was given to the museum in 1910 and is still missing. However, I did find in my research a letter Duvenek responded from Florence on March 29th. Through the kindness of Miss Blood, who forwarded your very encouraging letter to me concerning my three etchings, one of which you're looking at here on the screen, I consider myself very fortunate to find your valuable criticism so favorable and more so do I feel that I may do much better by more practice as these are the first etchings I ever made except two or three attempts, which I destroyed. My friend, Mr. Ritter, the bearer of this letter has number of proofs of the three etchings. I should feel greatly honored if you should be pleased to accept one of each. I hope to have the pleasure of meeting you next summer and profit by but a few minutes of your valuable time. <clears throat> So you're looking at one of three etchings that was in that first exhibition of the Society of Painter Etchers. And unfortunately, the portraits on the right are sort of blocking out the Whistler's Riva number two, uh, which obviously there is a sort of comparison uh, to the Duvenek etching. Uh, <clears throat> Both artists worked from an elevated position at different points along the lagoon, facing westward toward the Dodge's Palace, which you see in the very background. Um, Dubinek's sunlit palace and cropped campanelli command attention, emphasized by the docked vessels. Whistler's Palace is nearly lost in the upper right, which you can't see because of your portraits. Uh, <clears throat> But I certainly, both prints are in the exhibition. Uh, <clears throat> both artists use figure groups to counterbalance the weight of the buildings. Dubinek's uh, Lagana, <clears throat> Laguna, uh, uh, there are, <clears throat> this is uh, the early etching by Dubinek before um, uh, which is a very recent acquisition to the museum. And it comes from the estate of Otto Bacher. You see that stamp at the lower right corner, Otto. Uh, and that is uh, a print that previously we did not know and was not recorded in Emily Poole's compilation. Now we're looking at the Riva della Scaglione number two, uh, and this is the first and second state. Uh, in the first state, you see Duvenek dealing with the buildings and the, the sort of the edge of the river, waterfront with just a few suggestions of figures. Then in the second state, 
he adds he adds more figures into the foreground. And then in the third state, he basically brings it all together, re-emphasizing or reworking the, the figures in um, the foreground. Uh, anticipating an upcoming exhibition in Boston, Bakker's sent Sevilla Rosa Kohler, acting curator of prints at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, three etchings by Duvenek and prints by the boys, along with his own submission for uh, an April 1881 exhibition of American etchings. And this was the first exhibition in the United States of American etchings. Uh, <clears throat> the boys etchings reflect a debt, date, death, <laughs> excuse me, a debt to both the Duvenek and Whistler subjects. Uh, <clears throat> As a result of the exhibition in London, both Dubinek and uh, uh, <clears throat> Bakker were invited to join. And they had to, to, as part of the joining, they had to supply what was referred to as a diploma print. And uh, this is San Giorgio Venice done in 1880. And it was the print that he submitted Again, this was a print that was not known to Emily Poole. We do not have an impression in uh, the museum's collection. I have only been able to locate three impressions, one of which, of course, is the, the diploma print belonging to the Society of Painter Etchers. Uh, this is a, a one of the the third print, which was submitted by um, Gertrude Blood to uh, the exhibition at the Society of Painters in London. And again, you can see uh, the tower uh, and the very top of the uh, uh, San Marco with its three um, crosses, uh, four, excuse me, five crosses in the left. <clears throat> and this is uh, a work by Otto Bacher, Venice in Two Boats, done in 1880. Uh, it was uh, included in a book he wrote about uh, knowing Whistler. And you'll note that there is uh, a steamer in the foreground. Uh, another motif which uh, Duvenek included in one of his etchings. Now we're looking at the print of one of the Duvenek boys, Theodore Wendell. Uh, it shows more the impact of Whistler, who liked these sort of secluded passageways, which would have a figure hit, hidden in it. This is along uh, the, the Grand Canal, one of these uh, stops. Uh, I was actually had as an opportunity in connection with my research to actually go to Venice for the first time. And it certainly helped with my orientation. Uh, but I'm sure this is a stop along the Grand Canal. Uh, this is Plaza San Marco. Dubinik uh, went to um, Boston following um, <clears throat> his future wife. Uh, and renewed and then returned to Venice uh, in November 1882 and renewed his contacts with the cultured expatriate community around Catherine D. K. de Bronson uh, at Casa Alvisi and Adriana and Daniel Curtis at Palacio Barbio. He was welcomed back for his talent, not only as a painter, but for uh, <clears throat> directing Tableau Vivants. Uh, and this is a quote about a, one of the tableau vivants. There were beautiful tableaus that the other night at Mrs. B or Mrs. Bronson's, um, arranged by Dubenek, who appeared himself as Bravo of Venice in four tableaus, wrapped in a cloak, sharpening his sword, giving the blow, and lastly wiping the fatal weapon. It was tremendous and made the real blood run cold. And that particular 
ability at staging the uh, tableau vivants, I think also contributed to his eventual success in doing group compositions. <clears throat> now, on his return, Duvenick aggressively resumed etching using larger plates with bolder, warmer etched lines in a realistic vein. He focused on landmarks with local Venetians rather than the impressionist vistas, narrow canals, and dark passageways favored by Whistler. Plaza San Marco, a prime destination in the city, features a woman holding a parasol against the hot sun with her two girls feeding friends a frenzy of pigeons and various Italian types passing in the background. The etching is in reverse of the actual view. Uh, and that is, of course, a function of the etching process, which when you draw on the plate, you get a mirror view of the scene that you're drawing in the finished prints. This is in the second state. And he has added shading to the sky in the upper right and additional work on the male figure in the background. <clears throat> Castillo, San Pietro in Castillo. This is the large plate. It's Duvenek's second version uh, depicting Ponte de Quivale, the wooden bridge connecting the island, San Pietro, and the church to the western Castello. A preliminary watercolor sketch without the lobster part is on the verso of the water carriers, which is in the exhibition. Correcting the mirror image of the smaller first plate, du Duvenek took a damp impression, placed it face down on a larger plate and ran it through the press. And I know this because uh, I got permission from our conservator to put a sheet of acetate on top of the first version and do sort of a basic uh, outline of the, of the principal figures and then place it on top of the second version so that I could, it, by flipping the sheet, I could confirm indeed that uh, the plate uh, had been done from a, um, for, from the first version. <clears throat> you see the focus is on the lobster parts, pots in the, in the foreground and the silhouettes of locals crossing the bridge. Uh, using a second etch, he darkens the bridge enhancing the aerial perspective and refines the arrangement of the ripples and the reflections. And here you see a the original watercolor sketch, uh, which is not in the exhibition except illustrated on a label. The Grand Canal lined by a aristocratic palacios was the main archery of traffic between the east and west quarters of the city. Duvenex 1883 Gran Canal Venice mirrors the palace's opposite. You have Santa Maria della Salute, Palazzo Venere Cantanini, Palazzino Contari Vasan, and popularly known as Desdemos' house, Palazzo Monolesco, and Palazzo Fini and Palazzo Pazani Grite. Eliminating the horizon, he uses a distinct uh, sunlit 15th century architecture as a counterpoint to the busy gondola traffic. Working in plain air, Duvenek positioned himself on the plaza of the Salute opposite. Henry McBride, a New York Times mag magazine contributor observed, the artist's power to bring out characters appears in his portraits of buildings. He may take liberties with his boats and with the slouching graceful figures of his boatmen, but he takes no liberties with the spirit of the fair faced palaces, beautifully devoid of superfluous features, serene of classic proportions, yet piquant with the sprightliness of race that built them. Each of these architectural personalities is respected for its individuality and charm. The irregularities of roof lines, the grouping of the windows, the lines of the balconies, and Dubinek more than any other of the hundreds of who have done Venice shows the informality of structure. 
Two years later, Frederick Keppel and company published Grand Canal Venice with a new title, Desdemona's House, Grand Canal Venice, associating it with Shakespeare's Othello. <clears throat> Here we see uh, um, an 1854, 1854, the only crossing point east and west on the Grand Canal was the Rialto Bridge. Here we are looking at further along the canal's north side, the Palacio Ca de Oro, or House of Gold, the quintessential example of Venetian domestic Gothic architecture. Dubinek drew his largest plate from the fish market opposite, <laughs> emphasizes gondola movement against the asymmetrical sunlit facade with its delicate marble Gothic Eric Beak tracery and crenellations and their reflections. Since the mid 1850s, Venetian photographers, including Carlo Nyla, as you see a photograph of 1875, uh, <clears throat> correcting the reversal. Through this print is architecturally the same. Dubnik revised the figures and patterns of litter hatching throughout Introducing, a, oh, excuse me, I'm, I'm a little ahead of myself. Um, this is, a, the photograph is by Carlo Nyla. Uh, both Carlo Nyla and Carlo Ponte uh, met the demand for visual souvenirs of the city. Uh, but the photographer's ability to capture live motion was in its infancy. Uh, and there were shops by both owned by Carlo Nyla and Carlo Ponte along the Riva and in the Piazza San Marco. So it's very possible that Duvenek may have gone in and actually looked at the photographs and know that there was at least an interest in certain features. And then he goes out and captures his own view of the Cal de Oro. Now we're looking at two uh, versions of the Bridge of Size. Bridge of Size number one in 1883. Uh, and this is be, uh, the bridge behind the San Marco. Um, uh, the bridge between the Doge's Palace and the prison. Now the left version is a mirror image of the actual scene. And in um, 1880, Five, Dubinek went back and corrected the mural image. Uh, so you see the version on the left has certainly uh, a lot more sort of light playing on the structure and the activity. On the left, it is a lot, on the, on the right, it is a lot more solid. And it is the correct view. If you were a tourist as I was in Venice, looking at this particular scene, this is what you would look. But note that one of the gondolas under the bridge on the left version has been replaced by a smaller gondolier on the right. <clears throat> now, Duvenek spent the winter of 1884 in, um, <clears throat> Florence, as he did the winter of 1885. Though so you're looking at the second version of Ponte Vecchio from Ponte Santa Trita, a subject he was previously painted, and that painting is in the exhibition. There is a rough conceptual sketch in his 1883 to 85 sketchbook uh, for this composition. You're looking at the second state and in 1885, he again corrects the mirror image uh, of the Ponte Vecchio in the second plate. Uh, and um, in the first state version of this print, uh, there is another figure which has been replaced by that sort of bundle that's leaning against the wall of the bridge. Uh, what is particularly interesting is that sculpture uh, uh, on the uh, upper left is about 18 feet tall. Uh, and there's, 
he had to have worked from two levels. One, to, in order to get the whole scene, uh, he had to work from a second floor storage. You will also note that uh, on the left hand top of the bridge, there's a pencil work where he's considering making changes uh, in this particular state of the print. Um, and then to actually show the figures on, on the uh, crossing the bridge, he had to work at the lower ground level. And here you see um, <clears throat> the, the preliminary sketch from his sketchbook, which I believe if I remember, I haven't been up to look at the exhibition for a few weeks. I believe that's in the exhibition. Uh, and then you see again, it compared with his original concept uh, and the final print in the second version. Now, uh, um, one of the things that uh, the boys did was what they called Bakker types, monotypes. <laughs> uh, and um, this print by William Mary Chase, I believe is a portrait of Frank Dubinek. Uh, it is not, I've examined it. Uh, there's no title or identification of the sitter, uh, but just by looking at it and photographs of Dubinek, uh, there's no way that it cannot be Dubinek. Uh, and this is a fairly early example by Chase. Um, prob it probably done 1876 to 1878. He did not go with Dubinek to uh, Italy in his second trip. <clears throat> in the winter of 1884, Dubinek reestablished a school he had had in Florence, close to Thomas Ball's studio on the Dante de Castiglione. Monotypes were done to entertain Ball's guests and were witnessed by William Cooper, Ball's son-in-law, George H. Clements, and Julius Rosshoven. According to Clements, in a letter that he sent the museum in 1936 at the time of a major Dubinek show that the museum held, he uh, and Rolshoven hired a villa, uh, probably Villa Gould, on Via Poggio Imperiale, which uh, intersects with Danta da Castiglione. I've stood in the place. Um, I've designed, he designed a big wooden press, which answered perfectly. Opposite was the sculpture studio of Thomas Ball and his son-in-law, Will Cooper. The home was one of music and social distinction. On Mondays, the press was wheelbarrowed across for a monotype evening. Using a range of unconventional means, because they weren't etching with acid, and including such things as fingers, stick, rag or a broad brush, Dubinek manipulated a film of ink dramatically revealing the image, much like his Munich paintings. Um, the unusually large format of the monotypes um, was because the press bed was larger than the Bacher press bed. And so you're looking at a portrait of a girl here. It's a monotype which is not um, signed and witnessed. It is signed by the monogram in the lower left, but not witnessed by the three gentlemen. However, this particular recent exception, Muscle Gathers in Chioga of 1884, is signed in pencil in the lower left corner uh, as witnessed by um, <clears throat> Cooper, Rothschild, and Clements. Um, this comes uh, from a group of portrait uh, caricatures by New Dubinac. Uh, this is William L. Whitney, one of a group of profile caricatures. Whitney was in Florence studying bel canto, an operatic singing technique. <clears throat> Uh, Dubinek's printmaking ended in 1885, not long before his life changed dramatically. Marriage to Elizabeth Booth in 1886, 
the birth of his son, Francis Booth Dubinick in 1887, and Lizzie's death in Paris in 1888. Dubinick finally settled in Cincinnati where he taught at the Art Academy, becoming dean in 1905. He still retained 10 of his etching plates to meet the demand for exhibitions from dealers and from dealers. He enlisted his faculty colleagues, Lewis Henry Meekin and subsequently Herman H. Wessel when Meekin died to make prints uh, after from the plates. These are marked Cincinnati Museum Association and printed by Wessel or Meekin. And I would certainly appreciate any members of the Cincinnati Art Club that have works by Frank Duvenick to let me know because I'd like to examine them. I'm trying to put together sort of a count of the impressions by Frank Duvenick. <clears throat> In 1915, the Panama Pacific International Exposition was the most comprehensive art exhibition ever mounted on the West Coast. Duvenek chaired the Midwest Advisory Committee and was on the International Awards Juror. And thus, uh, he could not have um, his work recognized by a medal. He also was awarded a solo exhibition gallery. Uh, in preparation, the Cincinnati Art Museum gave local citizens a preview uh, of the installation to be seen at the exposition. Uh, it featured 44 works, including Munich School Paintings, Whistling Boy, Women with Forget-Me-Nots, and Turkey Each Page, all of which are in our exhibition, and 13 etchings and the plaster casts of Elizabeth Booth Duvenek's memorial. And here you see uh, from our archives, uh, a, a, the wall of etchings as presented or plan presented in the exhibition. Uh, for the first, the, 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 there was a review of the exhibitions. Uh, and I want to read you that review. Um, you, Eugene Newhouse reviewed uh, the gallery, pointed out the old style Munich paintings has been superseded in the affection of Americans by French methods. Only the greatest ever attained a capacity for direct painting, which characterizes this astonishing collection of pictures. Duvenek equally great accomplishment in the field of etchings are apt to be e oh, easily overlooked. And for the first time, Duvenek's major Italian etchings, which of there are approximately 30, just as individual as Whistler's, though quite unlike Whistler's, with his extraordinary refined and beautiful abstraction. Dubinick's work showed more robust and vigorous drawing and more objective observation, but each had a good deal of respect for the other's work. Uh, through Pennell's efforts and the recommendation of the foreign judges, Dubinick was awarded an honorary gold medal. And then there appeared at the same time in the Christian Science Monitor in 1919. The plates are actually mo among the most distinguished ever done by an American etcher. The subjects are the same as Whistler's, the Riva, the Rialto, the fishing boats, the canals, the lagoon. But that is only because these have always been the subjects of artists in Venice, as they must be as long as Venice is Venice, we know. Duvenet looked at it in his own way and recorded what he saw with his own lines and showed himself on copper, the master of composition. He never was on canvas. The series, when exhibited, would have made his name and he never been heard of before. There is not much doubt that when exhibited again in San Francisco exhibition, the etchings rather than the paintings were the final arguments for the jury to allow a grand medal of honor to be created that it might be bestowed on him. And what is very interesting is I have not found any references to any of his monotypes ever being exhibited during his lifetime. 
So that's um, my presentation. Uh, if we can do try and do uh, questions, I would be glad to try and answer. Uh, Everybody will have to unmute. Yeah. Did um, these etchings remain in Duvenek's possession through his lifetime? Did all the plates? Yeah. Uh, well, they were, there were, uh, you know, he must have traded with his students because Otto, ba Otto Bacher sale had a number of uh, the early etchings that even Duvenek didn't have in the museum, had to buy them. Uh, and then the one recent edition of the Riva, uh, which will be in the uh, Grand Experiment exhibition, or is in the Grand Experiment exhibition, uh, that also came for the Autobacher sale. Uh, I don't think that he was not uh, as into marketing as was um, Whistler. Mm -hmm. There are four of his prints which during his lifetime were um, formally published by uh, Dunthor. Uh, and um, then, uh, you know, he, there was always requests, I've gone through the archives of letters coming in um, during his lifetime and people would ask for, you know, I want, <laughs> want to have one of his prints in our exhibition. Uh, well, he, the, I think that the largest edition of any of his prints was about 40. Uh, and, and um, but then he had Wessel and Meekin print impressions. Uh, and we have no record as to the number of impressions uh, that were printed from the 10 plates that he retained, which are now in the museum's collection. Uh, what is a particular area of interest and why I'd like to look at uh, impressions that might be uh, out there. I've done a, a few museums collections. I'm writing to my colleagues uh, because long term, I'd like to sort of see my research uh, produce a catalog resume of Duvenex prints. Is some of the prints were printed on Chine Collet. Uh, which is a very fine surface paper, which is laid down on the larger support. And um, we don't have any knowledge as to uh, whether, uh, uh, who printed those. It might've been Goulding in London because he was a professional printer and, and serviced a lot of etchers. Um, but none of the Wessel or Meekin impressions that I've looked at are on Shin Calais. But I'm hoping that I can start doing a sort of a listing of those prints. Um, <clears throat> does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Ms. Spangenberg, um, you said the largest edition the largest edition of any print was 45. Uh, what's the average number of, of, of uh, copies made on any of these? Uh, well, we don't know for the Wessel and Macon. I'm hoping to, you know, provide, uh, to develop a list of impressions out there. So if any of you have impressions of, of any of the prints, I'd love to talk to you and see them. Uh, the, the Dunthor editions were supposedly 40, 40, and there were 15 that were signed, and um, the rest of the edition was not signed, which leads me to believe that Duvenek didn't go through London and sign them. Um, one of the things that I am able to do is to identify an early signature from a late signature, so he might have later on gone back and signed some of the prints. Again, that's something that uh, unfortunately, um, he, you know, he was in the, the first wave of the etching revival. And so standards that we have today of, you know, knowing that it's 23 out of 100 impressions uh, and that they were all printed sort of the same 
uh, didn't exist at that time. Um, so it makes it more challenging to do a compilation of his printed work. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, I noticed that they weren't numbered. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you was when you said he was working on larger plates. Yes. Exactly how, do you know how much, what the size of those plates were? Um, let's see. I think the Cade Oro is the largest plate. Um, and I don't have those measurements right in front of me. Uh, but if you send me an email, I'd be glad to um, send you the, the, the size of the dimensions. Well, the dimensions are probably listed on the labels on the exhibition, maybe? Uh, no, but they're probably, they're listed on our online collection. Okay, I can look there because yeah. I wanna go see all the mark making. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So. Vandenberg? Yes. Do you have an idea of why he stopped um, making prints? Why he stopped printing? Well, I think he had a lot of other things, um, you know, with getting married. Uh, he was also uh, not in in Venice, uh, which seems to be, you know, it was a way of um, you know, supplementing his income. I think that in Prince, also the the um, first wave of the etching revival had sort of started to wane. It gets picked up again later. Um, and, you know, he also, you know, it costs money to, if, if he was not printing his plates, which I doubt he did um, for a formal edition, it costs money to get that done. And he was always a little tight on the money end until he got married to Lizzie. Huh. Thank you. <laughs> Did she ever try etching? Um, she certainly did a lot of drawings. Uh, the, the, there's the charcoal club talks about doing etchings, but as of yet, I have not been able to link any prints to uh, the charcoal club activities. There were sort of like eight people members. She was one. Um, and, uh, you know, whether they used the term correctly or whether they might have been doing monotypes, because of course, if they were meeting into people's homes, you would have to have a press. Whereas with a monotype, you could rub the back of the plate because you're only going to get one print. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's, that's still a question mark out there as far as we have it in, in, in all of, you know, there's Julie, myself, and, and uh, Liz Simmons, who was uh, a research assistant for the exhibition. None of us turned up any etchings by her. Thank you. Could I also ask you a couple of more questions? Sure. Okay, so you said that you're going to do a catalog raisonné for Duvenac. Is this just going to be for his prints, or are you going to include his paintings with that? Uh, I think the prints are going to be a big enough project. Uh, you, I mean, you have, uh, of course, we amassed a lot of material, and, uh, you know, I think that Julie and the other essayists, you know, selected his most important important paintings. Um, we have, I'm sure, online all of the Dubinek paintings cited and listed. I'm not sure that the, we have, you know, professional photography of all of them because I wasn't really working with the paintings. Um, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not planning on doing a catalog of his paintings. If I do, I would include uh, drawings that relate to the paintings. I, I think Liz Simmons' essay on his drawings uh, is, is quite a, a step upward 
uh, and we do, we have acquired um, a new sketchbook, which is of course covered in the exhibition. It's a wonderful catalog. You yeah. guys did a wonderful job on that. Uh, my second question is, you mentioned a school that he opened up in Italy in 1884, is that correct? Yes. Um, can you give me, or do you remember your reference for that? Uh, Sorry. I'm sure I, ha I sure I have, but send me, send me an email and I'll, I'll look it up. Um, and what is your email? Uh, it's kristen.spangenberg at cincyart.org. And be sure to spell Kristen with an I, I N rather than an E N. And is that Cincy with a Y or an I? Uh, a Y. I'm okay. sure you can find it on our website under staff listing. Thank you. Are there any other questions? questions? Yeah. <laughs> if not, Kristen, if you'd like to turn hosting duties back over to me. Okay. How do I turn the duties back to him? <laughs> I want to thank everybody. I want especially to thank Kristen for the wonderful presentation. Um, and thank you all for attending. We only had a couple of little hiccups in it. And I think uh, it's worthwhile trying to pursue this again in the future. So um, thank you very much. I'm going to end the recording. And uh, we're going to call this a wrap. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.